So I want to spend a few minutes talking specifically about technical considerations of single cell RNA-seq experiments uh, that are specifically different from those considerations of bulk RNA-seq. And so one of the most prominent features of single cell RNA-seq data compared to bulk is the presence of zero inflation. So zero inflation refers to the fact that when you look at your data table that tells you how often each gene was detected in each cell, you can actually see a ton of zeros in this table. And so for example, for data that comes out of like drop seek experiments or 10x uh, chromium experiments, sometimes up to like 95% of your table are zeros. And so this is really striking. Um, and so if, for example, you were to take two replicate cells and sequence them using, say, DropSeq, uh, and you were to say, suppose you were to plot the expression level or the abundance of each gene uh, across the two replicates, you basically get a plot similar to the one you see here on the right. <clears throat> and so in an ideal situation, uh, this plot would actually be diagonal. So each point in this plot represents a single gene. Um, and so ideally you'd see a line on the diagonal, which means that you get the same abundance measured in each of your two replicates. But in practice, you see this cloud, which means that there's a lot of kind of technical noise in these measurements. And furthermore, you can actually see two bands on the axis. So one on the x-axis and one on the y-axis. And what these bands represent are, is basically zero inflation or dropout bands, where, for example, the band on the x-axis uh, basically represents, represents a whole bunch of genes where there was some non-zero expression measured in cell 2, but you measured zero uh, for all of those genes in cell 1. And then similarly, the band on the y-axis represent genes where you had some non-zero expression in cell 1, but you measured exactly zero in cell 2. And so a lot of these uh, dropout events are, um, are not that reproducible. So we'll talk a little bit about how these dropout events are, they tend to be correlated with poorly expressed genes. <clears throat> but in general, people think that um, one of the major sources of these dropout events is basically the reverse transcription step uh, that happens inside the droplets. And so generally speaking, that reverse transcription step is thought to be very lossy and poorly efficient. And so basically a lot of uh, poorly expressed genes essentially just uh, basically get dropped out of the measurement in that case. And so again, the end result is that many genes have uh, basically zero, uh, they have zero expression in the table, uh, whereas we think that they don't actually have zero expression. We think that they're being expressed at some level. So there's a number of sources of gene expression variation that drive the variation that you see between the single cells. And so a large part about single cell data analysis is trying to figure out which factors are really driving variation in your data. And so in terms of technical sources of variation that you don't really care about oftentimes, or that you're not interested in, uh, some of the common kinds of factors are things like batch effects. And so again, samples that are sequenced together in the same run tend to look more similar to each other than to samples in other batches. And so to mitigate this, people tend to try to multiplex multi multiple samples in the same run. So they sequence multiple samples in the same run so that you can compare samples within the same run uh, without concern for that type of batch effect. Um, in terms of library quality, we didn't really talk about how to dissociate tissues into individual cells, uh, but this is a really tricky process because when you use too strong of a dissociation protocol, you can essentially kill a lot of cells and reduce your library quality. But on the other hand, if you don't use a strong enough dissociation protocol, that can leave you with so-called doublets, which are essentially pairs of cells that are stuck together or triplets of cells stuck together and so on and so on. And that essentially means that at the end of the day, uh, if you're even able to push these doublets through your microfluidic device, your individual cell measurements are not actually of individual cells, but of clumps of them. So they're like mini, mini bulk sequences. And so there's a lot of variations in the different types of library pr protocols that you can use. Uh, and you can choose among them depending on whether you're working with, for example, fresh tissue samples or fixed samples, or sometimes you actually want to sequence just uh, RNA within a nucleus as opposed to within an individual cell and so on. Uh, 
and all of these choices basically affect your library quality. And so capture efficiency refers to how efficiently you can capture mRNAs once you lyse your cells. And so this can vary a lot depending on a number of factors, including uh, it turns out how many RNAs are actually in the cells in the first place. And so it turns out, for example, that cells that have a fewer total amount of RNA uh, tend to have lower capture efficiency for some reason. And so in terms of amplification bias, I mentioned that UMIs are one technology that allow you to detect PCR duplicates and remove them uh, after sequencing. And so in that sense, you can reduce PCR amplification bias, but you can't remove it completely, right? And so imagine, for example, that after PCR amplification, your library size is much larger than the number of reads you sequence. And so one problem you can, that can arise is that, sure, if you sequence PCR duplicates, you can detect that and remove them. Uh, but the problem you have is that if there are certain cDNAs that are not amplified or amplified very poorly, and they're present in very small proportions of the total kind of population of the library, then you may just miss them in sequencing and therefore just not detect them at all. And so what's listed under allele intrinsic variation basically refers to this transcriptional bursting that I was talking about before. So again, there's a lot of stochasticity in gene expression that can now basically be observed in single cell RNA-seq data. And so for example, uh, transcription for even constitutively expressed genes isn't really a constant process there's oftentimes, for example, bursting of transcription followed by pauses of transcription. And similarly, processes like mRNA processing and maturation is a stochastic process, which in turn kind of gives a variation in uh, what you measure with single cell RNA seq, because single cell RNA seq essentially measures like instantaneous measure measurements of gene expression patterns. And so finally, what's listed under allele extrinsic variation basically just refers to the fact that many people think that there's no such thing as a fixed cell type. And so cells are kind of, in their, in their minds, are, cells are constantly kind of moving through some kind of continuous cell state space, and you can never really find two cells in the exact same state. And so furthermore, because things like cell identity and function are also, uh, you know, functions of context and local position in the tissue, for example, since no two cells are exactly in the same environment, then that means that any two cells of the same so-called type are always kind of responding to different stimuli and therefore they're also constantly varying. And so I just want to touch uh, a bit more on uh, really obviously bad experimental design because uh, you can actually see a lot of experiments still being designed in these ways. And so suppose, for example, that you wanted to sequence a bunch of samples corresponding to multiple conditions. So if you have two conditions, it would be like a case control experiment, or you could have more than two. So in this case, uh, you have hypothetically three different conditions. And suppose that you weren't really thinking too deeply about your experimental design. And so what you did is that you sequenced your, for example, three groups of samples in three different batches where you happen to group uh, all of the samples from group one into one batch, all of the samples from group two into batch two, and all of the samples from group three into batch three. And so if you were to do this, what this means is that your batch is perfectly confounded with the group of samples that you're trying to sequence. And so any differences that you detect between say group one and group two could either be due to real biological differences between the two groups of samples, or they could be due to the fact that there's just differences between batch one and batch two. Um, and so again, because essentially batch is confounded with, uh, with group, then uh, you can't tell what differences are due to batch or what differences are due to group. So any better experimental design, if you have three groups that you want to test and you want to do sequencing in, for example, three batches, what you could do is you could divide each group into two, uh, two essentially replicates, where group one gets divided into replicate one, replicate two, uh, group two gets divided into replicate one, replicate two, and group three gets divided into replicate one and replicate two. Uh, 
And so then what you can do is you can basically divide the replicates among the batches such that each batch is composed of two different replicates uh, together. And so basically you choose one replicate from group one to go with group two, another replicate to go with uh, group one and group three, and then finally another uh, replicate from group two and group three uh, to form your three batches. And so two of the most basic kind of outcomes you can see when you, for example, visualize your samples after sequencing, uh, as shown here on the right, is that in the case where there's no batch effect, then that means that your samples from the same group should essentially appear in the same region of your principal components plot. And so here on the PC plot on the right, you can see that all the triangles group together. So triangles refer to group three. All the circles group together, and the circles refer to group one, and all the squares are together, which represent uh, group two. And so this illustrates to you that there's basically no batch effect in this particular data set. In contrast, when you have batch effects, these are pretty visible in your principal components plot. And so in the worst case scenario where batch is essentially the strongest factor that drives the variation in your samples, then what you can actually see in your PC plot is that all of the green uh, samples, which refer to batch one, are together. All of the orange samples, which refer to batch two, are together. And all of the, uh, all of the batch three samples, or the purple uh, samples, are grouped together in the principal components plot. And so uh, although in this case batch is driving all the variation that you see in your principal, in most of the variation you see in your principal components plot, um, at least now with this kind of experimental design, you can essentially correct for this batch, uh, this batch effect because uh, every, for every group of samples in your original study, they appear in two different batches. And so the differences, uh, for example, between the uh, the green triangle and the purple triangles basically tells you about the average effect of the difference between batch one and batch three, for example. And similarly, the difference between the green circles and the orange circles tells you about the difference in the effect of batch two versus batch one. And so essentially by because every pair of batches has some common uh, group between them, then you can essentially remove the effect of batch or the average effect of batch anyways, um, because you have samples from the same group spread among multiple batches.